Hi, this is Jordan Schroeder from Hephaestus. And I want to talk to you today about three ways that you can change your risk register in small ways that'll have a huge impact on the way that you manage cybersecurity risk. And so the three things I want to talk about today are um, your target audience for the risk register, your heat maps in the risk register, and uh, adding target risk. Now, we can talk about completely overhauling the risk register process and the, the fundamental principles, but I just want to talk about three small tactical things that you can implement today without it being a, a big project. So I promise these are simple, easy things to, to implement today. The first thing I want to talk about is the audience for the risk register. Most organizations create a risk register because the auditors told them to. They create the risk register, they assess the things, they uh, year, yearly review it, um, minute the fact that they reviewed it and hand it off to the auditors and the auditors are happy. But the risk register is not for the auditors. The risk register is for you. It's for the business, for anyone who needs to make a decision about those risks or in that risk context to know what are the th thoughts around that? What are the intents? What are the priorities? How does the organization think about these things? And so the risk register needs to be written and targeted for them. It also needs to be available for them to read and find when they need to find it, which in some organizations doesn't happen. But take a look at your risk register and do some critical thinking about it to figure out, does it contain the information that you want? Does it contain it in a way that's easy to consume? Does it have the level of detail that you need? If not, look at making some changes. Start adding some details, maybe some columns, so that it contains the type of information that would be easy for people to use. Now, the risk register, you can think of it this way. You have you have these risk meetings and you have these groups to get together to talk about risk. And there's a lot of discussions back and forth. There's a lot of expert advice and analysis. And then at the end, you have decisions that are made. You've got experiments that are uh, described. And so the risk register is like the minutes of those meetings presented in a highly structured way. And so if you think of it like that, you might be able to find some ways where it can be better used and better structured and more information is provided. So it becomes the de decision supports tool that it is meant to be. The next thing I want to talk about to make a small change that has a big impact in your risk register is heat maps, or as I like to call them, hate maps. I really hate these things. There was an original intent and original purpose for the heat maps in terms of visualizing some of the information from the risk management process. Heat maps now become this required thing that everyone jams in and everyone uses, but they have forgotten what the original purpose was and they've forgotten how to use it. And so it's now used in what I think is highly inappropriate ways and ways that actually create some danger for the organization and for the people using that information to make decisions. Now, I'm going to show you a heat map here, and this is going to be pretty typical for what I'm assuming you are pretty used to. So here you have a 5x5 five five grid, and it goes from green to red with a yellow and amber in the middle. But in a 5x5 five five grid, you can't cleanly distribute the uh, colors within the cells. So you're going to have a situation like this. Now, I grab this image straight off the internet. You've got this situation where you've got more green than you have red. And the question becomes, is that an accurate description of what the organization thinks of the risks in those areas? Your skewed or your, your bias in using the colors in this way is to the red. You know, and that can provide a misrepresentation of the information. Now, if you want to use a heat map in terms of visualizing some of this information, I would highly recommend that you would switch to a gradiated uh, version. Now, this is a little harder to do because you can't uh, color the individual cells as you, in, in Excel. This requires a, a, a only a slightly more complicated way of, of adding the color to an Excel spreadsheet. But it means that you have an even distribution of the colors and you're not misrepresenting the data. 
Another small note here is that this grid is a three by three. Now I could do an entire uh, separate video on why I think a three by three grid is more appropriate than a five by five grid. Uh, but as a bonus point, make sure your, your matrices aren't greater than five. I've seen nine and higher and that's ridiculous. Five at the maximum, three by three is actually better. But that's a sub point and that's another video. So the heat maps have a tendency to skew the uh, colors, to misrepresent the changes in the numbers underneath it, and to make everyone focus on the colors and not the numbers. So we have all these discussions, we have all this analysis in our risk workshops and in our, in our risk meetings, in our, in our groups, and we distill all that down into a number. And the number is an abstraction of the truth, right? It's trying to represent a whole bunch of things in a condensed way. And then we take those numbers and what do we do? We apply a color on top of them and then we're dealing with the color and not even the number. So it's an abstraction of an abstraction and it, you're getting further and further and further away from the truth. So I highly recommend that you do not mix your risk registers with your heat maps. Keep colors out of your risk registers. I've even seen risk registers where they don't even put the numbers in the risk column. They just put the colors. And this, this creates an unhealthy, unhelpful focus on the colors and not the information. And risk management is not about getting everything to green as cheaply as possible. It's about dealing with the risks and the information that's there in an appropriate way. So heat maps, Please tr try to limit your use of them. Use them for visual reporting only, but don't use them as your main discussion point. Uh, there's too many ways where it just becomes a distraction from your actual work. This brings us to the, uh, the last point I wanna make in uh, things that you can do to improve your risk register is adding the notion of target risk. Now in your normal risk register and almost every risk register I've ever seen, they have an inherent risk, which is the risk that this thing represents if you don't do anything. And then you have your residual risk. And your residual risk is what happens after you've treated it, after you've done things to try and lower the risk. So you've got your uh, inherent risk, and hopefully, hopefully, uh, the residual risk is then lower. But almost every single risk register I've ever seen in my career stops there. And that's a problem because what that means is that the organization or the risk group is focused on getting that residual risk as low as possible, whatever that means, and not an understanding of what the organization or what the risk managers think is okay, right? What's an acceptable level of risk? And so what a risk register can be and one way to really turbocharge that risk uh, that risk register is to add just one column and that's target risk. Now, some people have asked me, but aren't you talking about acceptable risk? And yeah, I am, but I'm making a small nuance. There are some cases where your acceptable risk is really low and you're not going to get there in maybe in two or three years. So what you can do is you can set staged goals down to acceptable risk. And so I use the term target risk is to where we wanna go next in this risk, not necessarily our ultimate goal. So uh, play around with the terminology and depending upon your organization and what works for you. But that's the general idea. You wanna hit your inherent risk, you wanna assess that, your residual risk after you've treated it, and then set that target risk. Now, here's what you can do with that information. Typically, typically, you'll have your residual risk and then your target risk. Well, what happens when your residual risk is already kind of low? Does that mean you're done? Well, if your target risk is lower, that means you have a gap to address. That means you need to do something even though the numbers are low or, heaven forbid, the color is green. So you can take a look at these, these levels and then make decisions about what to do and prioritize. Compare this to some risks, especially in cybersecurity, are really, really high in, in a residual risk sense. So the residual risk is really, really high, but if we set that target level, if we assess it and accept the, the risk at that level, then there's nothing to do. Even though it's high, even though it's red, there's nothing to do, right? We've accepted it at that level. We'll continue to assess it, but at this point, our target has, is met. So we end up with a situation where we've got 
red risks that don't need anything done to them, and then uh, low risks that actually have a gap that need addressing. And you'll only be able to identify those things and act on them if you add the notion of a target risk in your risk register. And that's as simple as just adding a, a, uh, a column in there and then perhaps adding a separate column for a gap between target and the residual risk. And then you, you look at those things that have big gaps and prioritize the larger gap items first. And it's really that easy. So these are the three things that will supercharge your uh, risk register and make it more of the decision support tool that it is meant to be and what your organization needs. Thank you very much. This has been Schroeder & Schroeder. I'm from Hephaestus.